Dear children of the Divine Mother, I do take this courage to address you as her children because she is the Divine and the whole world is her child. Each and every manifest being with life, without life, animate, inanimate, plant life or animal life, they are all her children. This is what she is. So in our traditional way of interpreting the scriptures, the conclusion is told right in the beginning the whole truth and nothing else but the truth <laughs> on your face. And then, slowly and slowly, it starts from the bottom and it builds itself up till you are rationally convinced, till you are, through your common sense, you are satisfied that what has been mentioned in the hypothesis is true. It really follows the same method of the present day process of education. Remember our school going days. I'll give you an example from the classes that we attended. In the geometry classes, you come to the classroom and I, you find the whole blackboard is written up by the professor. What is it? Today we have to study theorem number 13. And what does it let's say? Two sides of a triangle is greater than the third side. So the truth is being told you on your very face. Whether you understand or not is immaterial. Two sides of a triangle is greater than the third. Third side. Similarly, in our scriptures, the Divine Mother Sri Sharada Devi or the Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi. Who is she? That is the subject matter. <laughs> the conclusion has been sung just now. She is the Divine Mother of the universe. Now, I hear, I have a sense of respect for such authors, such poets, which has written such wonderful poems about her, when with respect and reverence I do not contradict. But here in my heart, I don't understand how could that very simple, modest, a lady from the villages, not at all littered, not at all so-called accomplished, how can you claim her to be the Divine Mother of the Universe? So, because of my respect and reverence, I may not say anything against, but somehow or other, I am not that convinced. I respect your emotions, but I don't convince myself. Now, how do you develop that conviction? Look at again how we are educated to develop certain convictions and carry on my professional life with those convictions. I was not born with those convictions, but I was exposed to certain ideas and slowly and slowly by culturing and cultivating those ideas, those ideas crystallizes into a rock-solid, clear-cut, rational conviction, duly supported by your robust common sense. And that, that conviction converts it itself into a motivation. That's what the management gurus teach you today, as if it is not known it. 
it is in way of life. That motivation helps you to transform your personality in keeping with your rational conviction. These are the processes internationally accepted, whether it is opera vidya, material sciences, or para vidya, the spiritual sciences. So, let us give you another example, and it will be absolutely clear to you. You did not know that there is some element known as ether. You did not know, but your teacher taught you and made some groundworks for you, so that slowly and slowly your capacity to understand is opening up and you are absorbing the concept of ether which was beyond your concept at point of time. So the process of listening first, cogitating about what you have listened, the second, and ultimately transforming your whole personality according to your conviction is the third, which is known as the process of being and becoming. That is, Shravana, according to our scriptural language, you first listen and hear. Keep your questions quiet now. Just give yourself a chance to listen, to hear, to be receptive, to be absorbent. Like a filter paper, like a blotting paper, like those pieces of textures you use in your kitchen to mop up extra water. Increase your receptivity by not questioning at the start. Absorb and receive as much idea as possible. Then you sit quietly and ask yourself how and why, what for. So now you are allowing your intellect to probe into what you have listened. And slowly and slowly, because of the attitude of probing, known as cogitation, manana, you come to certain rational convictions. You are convinced what has been said, what you received is correct. And then the third point is, you transform yourself, your personality, in keeping with your rational conviction. That is, your behavior pattern is tuned up with your rational conviction and that is the end of acquisition of knowledge. Now we say the Holy Mother Sri Sharda Devi is a mother of the universe, is a divine mother of the universe. Instead of talking academically to you today, let me tell you, dear, how it helped me to grow with this idea who the Holy Mother is. And I'll share a very, very intimate interactions that I had when I joined this order at the age of 22 and we had the opportunity of closely interacting with some of the direct disciples of the Holy Mother who were at the prime of their age at that time and they were in a position 
to teach you, to inform you, to make you receptive and help you to develop that conviction. So dear, it will be a philosophical discussion duly punctuated by personal experiences and reminiscences. Because Swami Harindavanandaji said, Swami, this abstract philosophy is no good. <laughs> you better add a little spice and salt to make it acceptable and to be ready to. So now, I will take that position and share with you how during these 62 years of my monastic life, how, who the Holy Mother is, that concept never had existed in me, how I was exposed to it and how that exposure slowly and slowly transforms my personality. I will share with you without any, I would say, reservation. The first thing you know, dears, these are the facts of history which you should know. The first thing is, we do not know actually when and where from this instruction came to the order that the Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi, her life, her way of living, her conduct, or whatever she may represent, should not be brought in public gaze before hundred years of her life, that is, before her centenary. That is, she passed away in 1920, and her century was in the year 1963, 64. <laughs> 64. 60. No, 53. 53. I'm sorry, 53, 54. 53, 54. That was Swami's. So 53, 54. So up to 1953, life and teachings of the Holy Mother was not discussed anywhere publicly. Even her birthday was celebrated without much of a fanfare in two or three places. All the ashramas never celebrated her birthday even. I do not know under whose instruction it was. But I now understand why that instruction was left behind. The society was not open enough to receive this very concept that she is at par with Ramakrishna. Even today, if somebody tells you, why Ma Sharda Devi is no less than Sri Ramakrishna, she sits there in her own right because she is the Divine Mother of the Universe. As I told you, you respectfully hear, but it will not ring a bell here. You always think, Ma Sharda Devi is not what you say. But you keep quiet. What is the difference, dear? The difference is very funny. In Sri Ramakrishna's life, you find a wonderful manifestation of excellence of spiritual experience and Sri Ramakrishna's whole <coughs> body, mind, soul was so tuned that that spiritual excellence was concrete, tangible. Mohur Mohur Samadhi. It takes a whole lifetime, if not one lifetime, several lifetimes to reach that height known as Samadhi. But here, this gentleman, Sri Ramakrishna, is going to Samadhi as easily as dropping a hat on the floor. And you are in Samadhi. And not only he is in Samadhi, 
the way he manifests that spiritual excellence. So that reverence and that awe makes you convinced that, oh dear me, he is not to be treated as lightly as I thought. The second aspect of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, look at his life. A young man in his 39th year, he shakes the world to its foundation and he just kicks at it and goes away, leaving behind such an impact which in his own words he says it will take 1500 years to understand, to appreciate, to assimilate. I'm not going to come back again before 1500 years. <laughs> so that excellence again, that overpowering presence has an effect on you and you are a bit scared of him. You have a reverence and awe, a respect for both of them. What you see in the Holy Mother, nothing to be told of. Nothing so catchy, nothing so impressive. How do you discuss our life pattern without any catchy incidents in our life? Mm. Therefore, <coughs> to understand from the human point of view who the Holy Mother Sri Sharda Devi is, you have to prepare a little groundwork. And there I will share with you how I was exposed to these ideas of which I had no concept at all. The first incident I will share with you is I had the great fortune of being a personal attendant at Valley of a Swami in his mid-sixties is suffering from tuberculosis. In those days there was no cure for tuberculosis and all that they used to do is to isolate him totally from the society and let him count his days to die. Somehow or other, that's a long story and personal not required, I got attached to him and I offered my services to him. He was Holy Mother's a disciple and very close to the Holy Mother. So while serving, he used to talk to me about spiritual matters, about how to meditate, what is Pratyahara, what is Dharana, what is Samadhi and so on and so forth. I was then 22 years old. So one day I took courage in my hands and I asked him, Sir, you have lived with the Holy Mother for so many years. You have been so close to her. May I ask you one question, Sir? Yes, by all means. Sir, have you seen the Holy Mother in Samadhi. Now, I was saturated with Sri Ramakrishna, that manifestation of spiritual excellence through the study of the Bhagavad Gita, the study of the Kathamrita, and through the study of Lila Prashanga, his biography. So I had a concept that Sri Ramakrishna had tuned himself in such a manner as soon as he willed it. And at that level, sometimes he used to talk, sometimes he used to express his joy in dance, in music and so on and forth. And thereafter, an endless flow of matchless wisdom. That's why these books have come into being. With that as a background in my mind, I thought, why should my mother not be so? They must be in the same mold, they must be in the same pattern. 
That was the motive of my question. Sir, you were with the Holy Mother for so long. Sir, have you ever seen her in Samadhi? I asked once, no response. I asked twice, no response. And then I found a stamp of annoyance is showing in his face. I couldn't make head and tail why that sign of annoyance. In spite of that, I asked him the third. <laughs> and out he comes. In the most chastising manner, almost a rebuke and a scolding, he says, I'm sorry, he says, what do you think of my mother, you, you boy, you thoughtless person? He used to very, very derogatory words in Bengali. <laughs> he said, you are very proud of your education, you say you are well educated, you are absolutely a stupid ass. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of my mother? <laughs> now look at the depth of attachment with the Holy Mother. <laughs> what do you think of my Holy Mother? Is she an ordinary aspirant that achieving Samadhi is something wonderful? You stupid ass, don't you have this concept? She is Shakshat Mahamai, she is Shakshat Parameshwari, she is the giver of Samadhi. <laughs> At her behest, the spiritual aspirants are blessed with that stage known as Samadhi. And you are equating her as an ordinary sadhika, whether she had Samadhi or not. Are you Murkha, you fool? He is, she is the giver of Samadhi. Well, that was enough of a mountain. <laughs> but he was so excited. He could contain it later on, and this will be almost like a bombshell to you all. Who is she? After a while he collected his breath and he told me, I understand why you asked this question. You are trying to compete with Sri Ramakrishna. You wanted to hear that the Holy Mother was at par with you. Now hear from me. It is she who is the cause of Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual excellence and its manifestation. She is Mahamayi herself. Because of Mahamaya's blessings, Sri Ramakrishna had this excellence of manifestation of spiritual wisdom. She is the giver of Samadhi. She is the cause of Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual excellence and the capacity of manifestation. That is the first exposure that I had from a Swami who, through this incident, passed on his concept of who she is to a person who asked because he genuinely wanted to know who she is. And according to his limited concepts, going into Samadhi is an achievement of lifetime and we see Guru Mahal going into Samadhi every other moment. Why not my mother go? 
he appreciated that I was trying to see my mother, Sri Sharda Devi, at par with Sri Ramakrishna. That much he, he appreciated, but he did not appreciate that I have not a proper concept of what the divine consort of an incarnation is. And now I admit I had no concept. The concept of Paramaishwari, just counterpart of Paramaishwara, I didn't understand all that. I did not understand that Parameshwari and Mahamaya is giver of all this until and unless she permits, nothing happens. I didn't know all that. That was the first concept that was given over to me. Good enough, dear. We'll develop this idea a little later on. I will share with you three different incidents of my life, of which two was direct, uh, one was through the books. The second was, Swami Vinayanandaji was my guru, I happened to be unworthy though I am, blessed by him. One day, there was an occasion when this point was in the air as it were. The mother, something about mother's celebration was being talked about and by that time it was decided that mother's celebration will be celebrated. So at that time I told Swami Virajanandiji, Maharaj, I have a little difficulty in meditating on the Holy Mother at par with Sri Ramakrishna. How is it that I must meditate on both of them or by turns? It cannot be one, only one. He listened to me and he said, well, well, come, I will tell you an incident in my life. What is that incident in Virajanandaji's life? Virajanandaji was born at a time in such a family, in such a locality. He could have had several occasions and opportunity to see Sri Ramakrishna in his physical form. <clears throat> but somehow or other, he had seen Narendranath, he had seen all others, he never had an occasion to see Sri Ramakrishna in his physical form. And when at the age of 16 or 15, he left hearth and home, and joined the Baranagar Mat immediately after Sri Ramakrishna's passing away and immediately after Swamiji has left on his wanderings in India, he came and joined the Baranagar Mat and Swami Ramakrishna Nandaji took care of him, took him up as a trainee. Since that day, he was suffering from this sense of inadequacy or insufficiency that I am such an unfortunate chap that having all this occasion I have not been able to see Sri Ramakrishna in flesh and blood. And that agony and grief he nurtured in himself without speaking to anyone. Once the Holy Mother Sri Sharda Devi was staying in Nilambar Babu's house, Puranavat. And as Virajanandaji was the youngest of the lot, and as my mother was very bashful, 
and was very withdrawn in presence of the direct disciples. So they decided that Kali Krishna, Virajananda, would be the right person to be handy to her and to be useful. And he was a young boy in his teens and a disciple of the Holy Mother. So he enjoyed Mother's company. He used to help her doing this, doing that. One day what happened, Swami Brahmanandaji sent for him and told him that a very important errand to be performed and I would not believe anybody but you. You please go to Calcutta, you'll have to stay there for three, four days and bring back these important documents to me for my study. And by the way, before you leave, go and seek Holy Mother's permission and blessing and then leave her. So that old pent up agony that I did not see Guru Mahanath and now I am being asked to leave the Holy Mother for a few days. So he was a bit sad. But what can be done? What has to go on? The mission's activities have to be done. So he goes back to the Holy Mother and then he finds he was standing at the door and Holy Mother was facing this wall sitting on her two feet, just like an Indian lady, and was doing some work. Her face was to the wall, and she were, he was standing at the door, just like this. So he announced from there, Look, Mother, I have to go to Calcutta for a few days. So Mother didn't respond. Then, all of a sudden, he thought this is the right time to unburden his agony to the Holy Mother. You know, Mother, I had such an amount of occasion and opportunities, but unfortunate that I am, God forsaken that I am, I never could have Sri Ramakrishna's darshan. I could never see him in flesh and blood. How unfortunate I am. He was highlighting how unfortunate, God forsaken I am. I could not see him. As usual, these, these mothers, family, and these realized souls, I do not know what happens to them. They take quite some time to understand what it being said. <laughs> Ma also did not reply. So he thought there's a distance and he out of reverence is talking very slowly, very, very softly. He raised his voice. Mother, do you listen? I have a great abiding grief that unfortunate that I am, God forsaken that I am, I could not see him. No reply. So, he says, I lost my cool. <laughs> I am trying to unburden my agony, expecting a little sympathy from my mother. And the mother doesn't bother to listen. So just like a petulant child, he raised his voice and said, Mother, do you listen to me or not? Then he sees the mother slowly and slowly on her feet, very deftly turning it up. After a while he finds the mother is face to face with him, sitting at such a distance. He is there, about ten feet away. And then, with her left hand, she removed that veil vigorously out of her head. You know, her face was always covered. In her and in a very reprimanding tone, 
Why are you accusing yourself as unfortunate and God forsaken all the time repeatedly? Don't you realize you are seeing him? Don't you realize you are seeing him? Present continuing tense in English grammar. <coughs> This mother's demeanor, with a scolding attitude and a raised voice, absolutely shocked him. He was totally taken aback by this statement, why are you always cringing and crying and blaming yourself as unfortunate and God forsaken? The literal Bengali word, Ki nije ke abhaga abhaga durbhaga bulche baba, tumi to takei dekcho. You are seeing him and him alone, takei, emphasizing. After a while, mother collected herself and told him, you are going to Calcutta. Rachel has sent you for a very important errand. It's good for you. Go. I'll wait for you, my child. I'll wait for you. But Vilayanandari could not understand what did the Holy Mother mean by saying, you are seeing him by unfolding her face. That was what haunted him. Mm. <clears throat> he walked out of his room, went to the ferry, and then took a boat. He had to go across the Ganga and then to Calcutta. And the midstream, he was still worrying, why did mother say so? You are seeing him. What does it mean? It was not clear to him what mother meant. Look at that. And then, when he was in the midstream, that was the last place where you can have a gleam of that house where mother stays. So she, he very lovingly looked at that house and to his utter surprise, to his utter surprise, he finds the Holy Mother standing in the corner of the veranda, totally visible to him and raising her hand in blessing. And in that spontaneous moment, Vinayanandaji understood, it dawned on to his understanding, what did Mother want to impress upon me? that she and Sri Ramakrishna are inseparables, are not different, they are one and the same. Did she? As because he was away for a while, being Swami Vivekananda's disciple, you hammer away at everything, be convinced rationally, then only accept, otherwise throw it out of the window. So he writes a postcard. <laughs> Dear Mother, the other day, this was the conversation with you. Do you mean to say, Mother, that you wanted to sympathize with me and assure me that seeing him and seeing you and seeing the Divine Master is the same? Am I right? And master and the mother replies, Yes, my dear child, whatever you have thought is correct and right. Now, of all this dramatics, dear, remember one aspect. It dawned on to Virajanandaji that is it this what mother meant? It dawned on to him when he saw mother standing and blessing him. 
mother gave that attitude to develop in Vidajadam. Prior to that, it was locked in a safe. So here are two incidents. Is she a Samanya Sadhika, an ordinary spiritual aspirant that achieving Samadhi is an achievement and attainment? He used to be that she is a giver of Samadhi. <laughs> and the spiritual excellence of Sri Ramakrishna happened because she ordained it. This is an idea that was put across to me. This is an idea by the Holy Mother herself put across to Grijanandaji. And <coughs> let us see what that matchless master Sri Ramakrishna thought of her and how she, when it came to that, put Sri Ramakrishna in his proper place. <laughs> now, this is what happens. If you take the two biographies, authentic biographies, and read it carefully, repeatedly, trying to find out the inner meaning of the happenings, not being carried away by the dramatics of the situation, make use of your common sense, make use of your brains, make use of all that you can gather within yourself to understand the intricacies and subtleties of this divine dispensation, this divine play, this Bhagavati Leela. Now what happens? You know this incident, I take it for granted, you know, a girl of not a very age, in her teens or late teens or twenties, somehow or other, the society stamped her, branded her, and discarded her as a person of not so high a character. She had nowhere to go. Somebody told her, you go to Ramakrishna, the saint in the nature, you will have some support. So she came and fell at Sri Ramakrishna's feet and admitted all that she had done. Sri Ramakrishna, don't worry, my dear child, your mother is still living in that Navadkana. You go and report yourself to her. Tell her I have sent you to her. And the mother gave her shelter and her son. And she became almost like a shadow to the Holy Mother, helping her in every act and deed and to make her life comfortable out of sheer gratitude that she has been forgiven and she has been pardoned and accepted as a team of the mother. Now, as you know, a prolonged familiarity gives you some desire to take liberties. What happened one day, the Holy Mother used to occasionally carry Sri Ramakrishna's dinner from her room to Sri Ramakrishna's room, which was a distance of about 20 feet. Now what happens, she could only go on such days when no devotees were staying with Sri Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna was alone. But day came when he, she found that Sri Ramakrishna was alone. So he prepared the plate, beautifully arranged, and you know, Indians are very, very fussy about it. With God is special. Everything <laughs> must be in the proper place, otherwise it's not worth eating. <laughs> so she arranged it properly. And while she walked out of her room to lead to the masters, that girl came prancing around, jumping around, dancing around. Ma, please, Ma, I would like to take it for <laughs> Guru Maharaj today. Ma, give it to me. Ma immediately handed it over. She was a cloud nine. She carried it. She kept it there. And she came away quietly. And a minute later, Mother walked in 
Sri Ramakrishna was immersed in his own thought, half lying in his bed. He says, get up dear, get up. Your dinner is getting cold. Get ready. Come, come. It's getting cold. So Sri Ramakrishna woke up. All arrangements were made. When Sri Ramakrishna wanted to eat, as soon as his fingers reached the food, like a repulsive shock, he said, couldn't touch it. He tries once, he tries twice, he tries thrice, and there was such a thing happening that the whole food was emanating a repulsion as it were. So he kept quiet, a little bit concerned, asked the mother. Mother was sitting there and quietly seeing, <coughs> didn't say anything. Asked the mother, how come I am unable to touch my food? Did anybody touch my food? I had to say, yes, so and so does. Immediately Sri Ramakrishna expressed her, his annoyance. Don't you know, dear, that I cannot touch things touched by people who are not pure at heart? That is why you and Lakshmi, you too bring my food. Lakshmi was Gurmaj's niece. Why did you allow her to eat? I'm not going to eat. It has been contaminated. <laughs> In our Bhakti Shastra, this is a fact of life, dear. If you have, by thinking of purity and the divine, in great depth for a period of time, you become so pure that you are so sensitive, any dirt or impurity you cannot stand. What to speak of Sri Ramakrishna, his purity personified. So that girl, however changed she may be, but she had touched that food and that food was contaminated. According to Bhakti Shastra, it is known as Sparsha Dosha, contamination by touch. That has what has happened to the food. <coughs> And what happens? Sri Ramakrishna is able to touch. What to speak of eating? He is unable to touch. Mother admits that so and so has touched. Sri Ramakrishna immediately, like an obstinate child, I am not going to eat. <laughs> Ma keeps on pleading, dear, please eat. Then Sri Ramakrishna wants to bargain. Come, give me your word of honor. You will never allow anybody to touch my food. If you give me this word of honor, I will eat. Now look at the mother. She quietly says, Look, dear, whosoever he or she may be, anyone under the sun, if he genuinely addresses me as a mother, I will have no heart to say no to his or her request. Now behave yourself and eat. <laughs> and Guru Maharaj Now, dear, let the dramatics go. What could have happened? Sri Ramakrishna's human form was in the purest of the pure level. The food was contaminated by touch. How could Sri Ramakrishna eat that? The only way that he could eat that food was the Holy Mother, Mahamayi Swarupini, Parameshwari, she 
by her look burned the impurity out of the food. Then only Sri Ramakrishna's nervous system could touch it. Now dear, this is an incident. Forget about the dramatics of it. Forget about the dramatics of it. Please kindly try and understand who could she be? Who has this capacity by a look only purify an impure food to make it worthy of her matchless master, Sri Ramakrishna? Who could she be? Now, let us stop for a while. <coughs> now let us go back to the dawn of civilization according to India's concept. The Vedas are the storehouse of India's spiritual wisdom. The Vedas started with people, ordinary people, living in nature, living with nature, interacting with nature, they started their life as observers of natural phenomena. If you interpret the Vedic literature, that is the starting point. From that observer of natural phenomena, they became appreciators, they became aware that because of this they are living. They became admirers. They started <coughs> adoring, worshipping the force of nature called as Devatas, Varun Devata, Water God, Sun God, Moon God, Air God and so on and so forth. Cloud God, Rain God. And slowly and slowly they found that the world is getting crowded with gods. <laughs> but they found when there is a motley crowd, there is lack of discipline. Whereas in this cosmos, it seems everything is happening in a clockwork precision and regularity, as if a supreme designer a supreme planner has planned and designed it, and he sits at the position to execute it according to plan and design. So, out of these gods, there must be a supreme god whose word is a law for all these gods. So, slowly and slowly, Bahu Ishwara. Bahu gods slowly and slowly confined into one supreme being, Paramaishwara, supreme god. When they were conceiving and considering the existence of a supreme being, Paramaishwara, they started asking themselves, how can I say it is the fatherhood of the divine. Uttava Kumara, Uttava Kumari. This is a quote from the Vedic literature. They were at such a juncture. The juncture was, we are convinced there is a supreme intelligence, a supreme power, a supreme energy at whose behest this whole cosmos is running in pure order. Now, how do I conceive the Supreme Being as a father figure or a mother figure? Uttava Kumara, Uttava Kumari, a masculine or a feminine? How do I consider? And you know what their considered opinion was? You can consider her as Parameshwari, 
the mother of the universe, the caretaker of the whole world. Or you can consider him as a Parameshwara, that ruler who sits on his throne on judgment to reward you or to punish you. That's the concept of God, reward and punish. And what's the concept of motherhood of God? Softness, sweetness, graciousness, ever forgiving, ever forbearing. That's the concept of motherhood of God. See what we do with nature? She's forbearing and forgiving. At that time of Vedic civilization, the concept of motherhood of God was established in human psyche. Good enough. Thereafter, we find various concepts of motherhood of God during the Puranic period and etc. has crowded the sea. And through proper spiritual discipline, there were sadhakas, aspirants, who were blessed by the vision of the mother of the, the mother of the universe, in whichever form the sadhaka or the sadhika wanted to experience her. This is what has happened. But dear, in human society, up till now what do we see? We find the fatherhood of God has such a tremendous hold on human thinking that <coughs> when God appears in the form of incarnation, sometimes to meet the needs of that time society, it is not required to bring his divine, divine consort along. Christ came alone. Shankara came alone. There are so many who were not accompanied by their consorts. There were some cases where consorts were accompanying them and the consorts played such a martyr's role to enhance the standing of their matchless husbands. Rama, Krishna, Buddha. Nowhere do we find the concept of Parameshwari in human flesh and blood as a consort to the incarnation of the Divine, playing the role of his or her matchless master. They are always in the background, martyring, martyring themselves to enhance the standing of their matchless mind. This is the whole history of human civilization. I am not saying anything out of it. Occasionally, one or two came to the top and they were burnt in the stake. John of Art was burnt in the stake. Christ was crucified brutally. This is what the world has done to the children of God. And I remember there's a saying, I, I don't know the Latin words or the French words, but it was translated by George Bernard Shaw. When St. John, John was being burnt on a stake as a witch, she looked towards the sky and addressed her father in heaven. Oh, Father, when would thy people be fit to recognize thy messengers? This is the history of the world. So what I am trying to drive home is, the world has never seen up till now what that concept of Parameshwari, Mahamai, Adya Shakati, would mean to be in concrete flesh and blood. The world has never seen an example of that yet. 
it was left to Sri Ramakrishna to bring his divine consort along and between them they balanced the whole game in such a manner that Sri Ramakrishna started his activity as a minister, as a founder of a movement, but he withdrew and left this person, Sarada Devi, to carry it on for 34 long years. The incomplete activity started by an incarnation of the divine being carried on by the consort for 34 years. First time in human history. So now dear, let me conclude by asking you, who is she? Please, these are the guidelines. Make a world of inquiry. Study all the biographies that they are, there are. Only make sure they are authenticated, not a cock and bull story, miracle monger. <laughs> so, dears, with these few words, let us then try to apply our mind to find out for ourselves who this Holy Mother is. Contained in this small little frame, unable to write a letter properly in broken Bengali language, that is her mother tongue, that is the extent of her wisdom. Sri Ramakrishna was exposed to hearing all the scriptures of the world because he insisted, let me hear, and he could understand the import of what he hears. This lady had nothing to do, but she is who controls the destiny of the whole human society. That is the concept of the divine mother of the universe. And to establish that, dear Sri Ramakrishna, as the last stage of his spiritual discipline, worshipped her as Tripura Sundari Shodaki of all aspects of the motherhood of the Divine. You see all frightful pictures of the mother. Uh, a garland of skulls, a bleeding head and all that. With all that aspect of the motherhood of the Divine, Sri Ramakrishna chooses and invokes that aspect of the Divine Mother, known as Tripura Sundari Shorashi, which means the softest, the sweetest, most gracious, ever forgiving, ever forbearing motherhood of the Divine Mother of the whole universe. In her lifetime, Allow me to tax your patience for a while longer. In her lifetime we see how her motherhood of the Divine manifests in small, humble, tiny manner. Let us start an example. We have seen how she asserts herself with her matchless husband. Now you better eat. And he, like a chastised child, how could he? With her vision, she purifies the food which was contaminated by Sparsha Dosha. That is how she deals herself with her husband. Now, let us see another aspect. Swami Vivekananda. There was an outbreak of epidemic of plague in Calcutta. Swamiji thought, here is an occasion 
to express to the society what is meant by serving the divine, serving the man. Jiva Shiva Jnani, Jiva Shiva. So he started looking around to raise some funds to start the epidemic. What clear funds were not coming. He was so frantic, he decided he will sell away the Bengal word property. After all, I have bought it, I said it. <laughs> Who will stop him from doing so? Nobody had the courage to stand up to him and say, don't. So what happened was, words were sent to the Holy Mother. Ma Noreen wants to send away the Bengal word. Send away the Bengal word. Ma quietly says, ask Noreen to see me. I haven't seen him for a long time. <laughs> It is said, of all the direct disciples, Noren really knew from day one who is the Holy Mother. And that Noren, it is said, used to go to the Ganga and keep on dipping and bathing to make himself absolutely pure enough to present himself to the Mother. That was what Mother was to Narayan. Nonetheless, he reached and said, Ma, you wanted to see me? The Ma says, yes, my dear child, what do I hear? You want to sell away the what, the what? And Swamiji had an occasion to lecture her. <laughs> Kept on talking with great emotion and passion. Ma, it has to be there. That is why Gurumayana was born. So I have to do it. And I don't have any money. What can I do? Now listen. That uneducated, unlettered woman. What does he say? She say, Noreen, I am told when you registered this property, you made Sri Ramakrishna the owner of this property. Devattara. You made Sri Ramakrishna the owner of this property. How can you sell, my dear? You are not the owner. <laughs> Talking like a barrister. <laughs> <laughs> and when Narinrath was not satisfied, see the mother in the Divine Mother. Why are you so worried, Narin? You pray to Guru Maharaj. I will also pray for you. Money will come. Your work will be full. People will learn what is Shiva Jnana and your Shiva. Be rested, Narin. Be prayerful. And precisely that is what happened. Narin was calmed down. The movement was not sold. And money came in to start the plague epidemic work led by Sister Nivedi. There is another aspect of the mother in this incident. I am removing the two. So, as an administrator, she puts Naren in, her own, in his own place, as she has put her husband in, her, in his place. <laughs> now you see what she tells Naren. Naren, listen, my dear child, you direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, you are outstanding spiritual personality. For you to live under a tree, to beg a mouthful to eat, is nothing. It's a part of your life. You can do that. You are that strong. But I see the children who will come to me in my in future, they will look after me. They will not be as strong as you are. They will need a shelter under their head. They will need a cloth to wrap themselves on. And they will need belly food to eat. After great prayer to Guru Maharaj in Bodh Gaya, he has been kind enough to give this mat to us. Please, Narin, for the sake of posterity, don't say it. A mother caring for the children who are not born even. They will come to her and she needs to protect them. 
that is what the mother beyond time and space and causation. That is why Virajanandaji used to address her, not a mother of this physical life, she is my Janma Janma Antarirma. She is my mother for lives together that I may be born. She will continue to remain my mother. So dears, now remember, try to find out who is she, Ma Sharda Devi, who is she. And dear, the last word as a guide to your studies in future regarding this literature. For heaven's sake, start with this hypothesis as I told you. There has been one incarnation. Divine descent has happened. Because of the complexities that we humans have created for ourselves, this divine descent had to take three different human forms to respond to the complexities and problems of the present day society. Sri Ramakrishna, who through his Suddha Sati Bhagavati Tanu established the lost veracity of Vedic truths. His life was an example, a demonstration laboratory. The Holy Mother Sharda Devi epitomizes in flesh and blood what is the concept of motherhood of the divine, the mother of the universe. And Narendra is the mouthpiece of Sri Ramakrishna's teaching in a language that modern people understand. Three different bodies were required by the same descent of the divine to meet the needs of the time. Therefore, dear, though physically they are three different forms, but you will always find they three are put together and worshipped as an indivisible whole. So when you start studying on this subject, start with this premise that in this complicated <coughs> society of ours, which we have by our own foolishness and stupidity made so complex that the divine had to take three different forms to encompass the whole gamut of answers and solutions to the complexities that we have created. That is why in one of the Pranam Mantras, which I am going to chant to you now, you will see the meaning of it. It is said, Jathagini Dahika Shakti, fire has two qualities. It has luminosity and it has capacity to burn. As the capacity to burn is inherent in fire, Ramakrishna is Thitahiya. He who resides in Sri Ramakrishna, like inseparable burning capacity in fire. That is, Sri Ramakrishna and Sri Sharda they are not two different entities, just like fire is not separable from luminosity and the capacity to burn. Similarly, Ramakrishna Sharada cannot be separated. Jathagni Dahika Shakti Ramakrishna Stitahiya He who resides in a sense, in that descent, Sarvavidya Sarupam Tam. She is the source of all knowledge. If you can get hold of her, she will explain to you the mysteries of the whole spiritual world. And you'll be able to master the mysteries and be one with her. 
सर्व विद्या स्वरूपा का शारदाम प्रणमामी और आई बाव डाउन टू माई मदर श्री शारद Thank you, dears. Thanks for your patience.